Hi everyone, welcome to this session. Good morning. And today for this panel, we, the topic under discussion is reducing trade friction between Asian nations post COVID-19. It's a particularly interesting topic coming as it does at this time. Uh, we've seen a lot of developments over the past three or four years and more so in the last, last few months. Um, it's been a very interesting time for globalization, for trade, for global economic integration. We've seen a number of economies, a number of parties in different countries want to pull back from free trade and globalization, holding it responsible for things like social inequities. However, that said, we've also seen some interesting developments, the biggest of which, given that we are focused on Asia, is the RCEP. The RCEP is, is eight years in the making, 15, year, 15 countries coming together, representing almost a third of global GDP, a third of the global population. It's an interesting, it's an interesting discussion to have also because of India's withdrawal. With, with India in it, it would have been a much larger trade deal. So there are a lot of interesting topics. We, you know, the subtext is there are tensions between Australia and China. There are long-standing tensions now between the U.S. and China with regards to trade as well as tech transfers. All of this has implications for other economies in, in the region and on supply chains in the region. So we have a, a very interesting panel, a roster of speakers. Without taking up much time, I would just like to quickly introduce everybody. We have uh, Lee Cheng who's a shareholder at Mashoff Brennan, Sashi Reddy, managing partner, SRI Capital, Henry Wang, uh, who's the president of the Los Angeles China India uh, China Investment Promotion Center, John West, executive director of the Asian Century Institute in Australia, and Howard Wu, president of Can Achieve China. Gentlemen, you know, we'll go with the screen, and as your, as your names appear, just quickly introduce yourselves and more importantly, just introduce the topic and what are your first thoughts? What were your first thoughts when you first, when you were first invited to speak on this topic? We start with John. Uh, thank you, Sid. Uh, I'm John West in Sydney, uh, the Australian Asian Century Institute. Uh, quite frankly, I'm rather pessimistic about uh, trade uh, frictions, uh, particularly uh, across the Pacific between China and America. And of course, that spills over into the rest of Asia. And for someone coming from Australia, uh, a possible, you know, positive angle for us is middle power uh, cooperation. Countries like Australia, Japan, uh, Southeast Asia working together uh, while the big guys, uh, uh, China and America, fight between themselves. And I'm also a bit pessimistic on India. Laying the ground there. Howard? Hi. Hi. I'm, I'm currently based in Vancouver now. In fact, I just came back from Shanghai a few days ago. So I'm still uh, quarantining myself according to the local requirement here in Vancouver. Uh, so basically... You know, since since uh, a part of my time has been spending in China, uh, I have a strong impression or have a strong thought about the U.S. trade, U.S.-China trade friction. I'm pessimistic as well, at least at this point of time. You know, leaving, uh, let's just see what will happen uh, in one or two months. Uh, when the president, when the new president, come to the stage. Okay, thank you so much. And we have Lee. Hi, Sid. Thank you very much, and thank you all for attending uh, the session. Um, some of you at, at a very early hour. I'm currently uh, so I've been uh, engaged and working with clients and working for companies that have engaged in Asian trade now uh, for almost thirty years. And um, I'm currently with a law firm called Mashoff Brennan. I'm the chair of the corporate group and the co-chair of the Asia practice. 
Um, and my view of, uh, I, I, so John, before everybody popped on and we went live, John said that uh, in another context that Americans were characteristic, characteristically optimistic. So I'm going to take the optimist perspective uh, in terms of, uh, you know, Asian uh, trade frictions uh, on a moving forward basis for Asian countries, because I think there are tremendous opportunities. We'll go into that in more detail for Asian countries. Largely, I mean, candidly, it's it's driven by it's going to be driven by the great power, um, the great power uh, uh, sort of uh, issue relations, U.S.-China relations. But there are there are countries that are going to thrive tremendously by avoiding, right, to the extent possible, the great power rivalry. And there are con countries that are going to do very very well by embracing it. Some of them don't have a choice, but they're doing very well right now. You know, as 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 we uh, are, are actually seeing in 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 2020, there are some place um, some. Uh, so, for example, one renegade province that's doing very well economically um, because of the great power rivalry. So, I, I, I'm an optimist. I think Asia. I'm very bullish on Asia, and particularly bullish on um, the less developed uh, regions of Asia. So you're on mute. Oh, sorry. Yes, Sashi, would you go next? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So I run a small venture capital fund. I, uh, I live in Philadelphia, and uh, we invest in the U.S., uh, India, and in Singapore. So I guess my understanding of uh, trade comes through uh, like issues around tech and the flow of capital between um, between the U.S. and um, and I guess some understanding of China as well as uh, with India. So I would say that I got to say that uh, at least for the foreseeable future, I don't see things significantly improving um, in terms of uh, trade-wise. I think there's a significant uh, shift in the popular like perception of um, of China, and I think uh, we should not expect to see any significant changes under the Biden administration. I think you'll see. Uh, bit more of the same, maybe not as much uh, of the rhetoric where some, uh, you know, big statements are made, but it's more at, at like a policy and the actual implementation level. I think uh, what we've seen in the last few years is going to probably continue under Biden. I don't see any significant changes. So to me, the big issues would be on the lines of um, uh, what happens with RCEP? Uh, would like the US uh, reconsider joining the old TPP, you know, those types of issues are, I think, where it's going to play out. And I think, uh, as you said, Lee, probably it's going to be uh, that either people join one of these two large camps or try to find a way to survive in that intersection without uh, like really upsetting either giant. <laughs> so that would be my view. Okay. Thank you so much. Henry. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for uh, inviting me for this panel. Yeah, uh, the first impression that I got the invitation was, you know, the, uh, we are the uh, uh, investment promotion agency based in Southern California. We've been helping Chinese companies, Chinese investors to invest in the U.S. But last year, we suffered a lot. Uh, a lot of uh, business deals have been killed uh, or, uh, because of the, uh, the administration, Trump administration's new policy on Chinese companies. And yes, I totally agree with Lee, with, with John, about the, the future of the China-U.S. relationship. But uh, you know, we are very, very carefully uh, uh, to see that the, the new administration probably is Will be a different way of uh, China policy uh, compared with Trump administration. Probably a different way, but in uh, probably in a very little bit projectable way. But we see that uh, the Chinese community in China, uh, business community in China, is very very happy to see the transition is going to happen. But you know they are still hesitant to to make some movement. But I already received. The, very signal they want to come start the conversation with the U.S. counterpart right now, but still they wait to see if anything will be clear. The new administration, uh, they have some concern too as well because uh, you know the, the the new 
news say that, that the U.S. government is going to be、uh, targeting Chinese companies in the U.S., especially public traded company. Even though they are asking every foreign company in the U.S. listed in the U.S. exchange will be compliant to the SARS, but、uh, many many Chinese business leaders think that this is targeting Chinese company. So there are some misunderstanding over there. We need to work together to to help them to communicate to make this work. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I think that really sets the stage very interestingly. I think it's a It's it's a great summary of some of the key topics that that are playing out, some of the key themes that are playing out. One, of course, seems to be, you know, the trade and tech war, as it's called, between the U.S. and China, which has implications for a number of other countries in Asia as well, with some countries gaining as a result of what's happening.、Uh, the RCEP comes in, under the the broader theme of how Asian economies have, in the past two decades or so. Have tended to, in many ways, take the lead on global economic integration. Asia's economies have prospered. I wouldn't say mainly, but to a great degree, as a result of its of of engaging in free trade and in global supply chains. It's something that it's it's a promising sign that Asia is not willing to turn its back on free trade, and it sort of comes against the current of. Deglobalization and isolationism that that was being talked about and being seen in many other parts of the world. At the same time, one of the things I think that's interesting is could we see Asia a little bit more on its own with with trade pacts such as the RCEP? Could there be, to a certain degree, a greater reliance on on domestic demand? And when I say domestic, I mean demand across the region. I think one of the interesting things to talk about, particularly when it comes to trade friction, is is the role of India in the RCEP or now outside of the RCEP. You know how much of it is,、uh, how much will it impact the RCEP going forward? Given especially that that one of the key strengths of the RCEP is its scale rather than its depth in terms of what it covers. So with all of these topics,、uh, one of the one of the themes that Uh, John had mentioned earlier was about whether the removal of trade barriers is enough, and you know, what about infrastructure and restrictions on investments. So that sets the stage very nicely for this panel. It seems to me that that none of the panelists, other than Henry to some extent, is、uh, and sorry and and Lee. Are particularly optimistic about what is going to happen in the near future. I would like to start this discussion more comprehensively with the RCEP and what it really could mean for for Asian economies and for global integration. Any of you would like to take this topic, this question first? Lee, you were talking about the RCEP. Would you like to address this one first? I I I I I don't think I was talking about the RCEP.、Um, no, you when you talked about、uh, anybody who would want to talk、uh, about the RCEP in particular, John. I, I yeah. I mean, the RCEP of course is a it's an interesting,、uh, an important initiative to、uh, bring together all of these economies to reduce the reduce the barriers to, to trade and investment. But、uh, I think.、Uh, My assessment of the RCEP is that it's important, but it's actually a modest、uh, initiative. It can't be compared with the TPP, which、uh, goes much broader in terms of intellectual property, state-owned enterprises, non-tariff barriers, and so on. And,、uh, and as Sid mentioned, there are、uh, many other factors which are relevant to trade, which、uh, notably infrastructure. And many of our Asian countries have, in fact,、uh, great infrastructure deficits. So、uh, yeah, I see the RCEP as being one small step forward, nothing more than that. But、yeah. if I can make a, a general point on、um, uh, on the, the US China, you know,、uh, the US and Europe and many countries want to see、uh, big changes in China's mercantilist model of development.、Um, yeah, China, of course, is accused of. Uh, having state-owned enterprises, state-owned banks, lots of subsidies, intellectual property theft, forced intellectual property transfers, and so on. 
uh, but China is not willing to change this. Um, and so this, I think, is at the heart of uh, the big difference between the two, that the West wants changes, China doesn't want to change. And so this is affecting trade because uh, China, in response to this, is adapting. And, of course, one thing that China is keen on doing is establishing technological independence, uh, developing technologies itself rather than relying on Western Yep. Made in China 2025, of course, was an initiative there. Um, China is now talking about dual circulation. I think there's many interpretations of that. But, again, that seems to be a bit of an inward-looking thing. China also is redirecting many trade and investment activities to Belt and Road Initiative countries. And so we may have an emerging block of trade with the BRI countries. And, of course, in Australia, of course, you know, we perceive China as being um, attacking Australia with economic coercion. And so China also is, you know, punishing countries that uh, do things that China doesn't like. So China is, I think, moving in a quite different direction on, on trade and investment issues. And uh, part of that is its traditional mercantilist approach, but part of it is a response to uh, the West trying to push it to change and its refusal to change. I hope I haven't lost any sure. in that comment. No, thank you so much. I think yeah, I one can. of the other... What, when when we speak of the RCEP, I think one of the reasons is, like you mentioned, John, it's not stated often because the key, com key, key countries in the RCEP are the ASEAN countries, which typically do not tend to to voice their opinion on, on international affairs as such. But I think that is one of the key reasons why so much of an effort was made to have India on board as well. But without taking up too much time, Anybody else would like to come in and talk about just the Asian trade scenario a little bit more before we can before we zoom in a little bit more on US China trade relations. And I would like to open questions to the audience. Please feel free to write in at any point of time with any questions that you have. Sashi, would you like to go next? So I don't have any like particular views on the RCEP. Uh, Not necessarily, yeah. Yeah. So in terms of uh, like broader like U.S. China issues, I think that's where I think uh, you know I've been spending some time trying to understand things. And I think mm -hmm. one way to sort of uh, frame those issues is around uh, say like the TikTok deal, right? So that created such a huge uh, uh, sort of like press in the U.S. and uh, you know, like if you just think through what happened with like TikTok and uh, it getting, uh, or like it's not yet like really banned, but the threat was to ban it, is that I think the TikTok issue got framed like really rather poorly as one of like national security as opposed to being framed as one of uh, well market access. You know, just like uh, if you look at like say China has blocked, you know, Google, Facebook. YouTube, WhatsApp, and all these various social media companies. So I think like the right way to sort of frame the TikTok issue would have been as like a open market access issue rather than one Correct. of national security. But to go back to John's point about you know uh, us wanting to see uh, change of of the state-owned companies, actually that's not the issue when it comes to like the U.S. view of what national security. It's more of not being clear about who owns what. So, for example, when we try to apply like the CFIUS rules in the U.S., right, it's more about trying to understand uh, not so much whether it's a Chinese company buying something in the U.S. If you look at the number of deals that got reviewed last year in 2019, uh, as many of the Chinese deals got looked at as deals from the U.K., as deals from, from like, say, Japan. So there's an equal, like, a scrutiny on all of these deals. It's just that I think when it comes to like, the Chinese uh, deals, it's not, uh, very clear about who owns what and what's the degree of state control. So it's not that we want to change state control as much as just understanding to what degree does the state own that entity and would then that impact uh, having access to the IP. So I think that whole thing is how I sort of find uh, this entire discussion around uh, the China-US trade war on tech 
You have to think okay. in terms of those things, the way I see it. Sure. I'm not sure I would agree, Sashi, with um, the you know with, with characterizing uh, say TikTok and and say Huawei right as as concerns over but certainly not Huawei for instance as a concern over market access. You cannot divorce right national security interests from the scrutiny and from the actions taken because I think it's pretty clear. I mean, as early, as late as for example. Um, you know, what happened recently with Ant's IPO, right? You know, the, the state controls everything in China. And we're, we're, we've gone back to the dynastic system and, and the state controls everything. And, um, you know, and, and, and that drives, that, that is absolutely, I think it has driven, and it's just been, it's something that people have been recognizing for probably the last little, you know, last five or six years, certainly. It was certainly recognized as a possibility, historical, theoretical possibility for the last 10 to 20 years. And it's only going to, it's been called out in the last four, right? You know, by the Trump administration. It's just, he's, he's a blunt, he was a blunt guy, you know? And I think that the Biden um, in administration is probably going to use more diplomatic terms, but it's still been called out. And, and I think that's going to drive. Um, it, it's not, it's not market access. It's basically, uh, it's not even IP. It's basically what will those instruments be used to accomplish in American society, right? So it is a very real concern if, for example, significant amounts of money are being put into creation of content that are being, that's being pumped across, you know, across, you know, U.S. screens, right? Where, where you know, certain national flags, you know, are removed from Top Gun, right? Or not national, provincial flags are removed from Top Gun, right? You know, bomber jacket, that kind of stuff. The, it's the soft influence that that's been it's been called out. I, I don't think Chinese deals are are going to be tr- treated equally, you know, moving okay. forward and, and for national security reasons, very legitimate national security reasons. Henry, would you like to come in this discussions? It's quite interesting. Let's let's hear the other perspective on it. Yeah, I totally understand Ms. Lee, uh, agree with Lee's point. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, something the U.S. is, uh, definitely determined to, to, to confront with China. But of course, China did something wrong and didn't, uh, do, play the game by the rules of, of course, this is, this is true. But, you know, the U.S. is definitely is a top destination for Chinese investment as well. Mm-hmm. So especially the private investments and the capitals that uh, the, the one that come to U.S. sooner or later. But if there is a possibility, they definitely want to come. So for example, the uh, you know the Chinese students you know, due to COVID, due to the border close, ban travel bans to Chinese companies and Chinese students, they are waiting. So um, I heard a lot of stories. Uh, when the doors open a little bit, they are they are flooding in. So a lot of Chinese students go to Singapore and mm. to take the, the visa interviews, to go to London to take the interviews and to get the visa to come to more states, even now. So yeah, quarantine 14 days in Singapore and, and then come over here. They quarantine 14 days in Cambodia and come over here. So, <laughs> so this is happening. I, I'm so happy that you know, there's more and more Chinese companies and, and, and even individuals they come, want to come over here and to, to create opportunities for the, their career buildings. So Chinese money definitely need U.S. market, but U.S. probably they are afraid that they, they have complaints of the, the Chinese behavior. But sooner or later, at least they will compete on a stage that everybody plays by the rules. I'm looking forward to see that opportunity, to see that happening in the future. But the Chinese side has to understand that play by the international universal rules is so important. You can't do that inter, internal circulation alone without the rest of the world's computation involvement as well. So that's my point. Your, uh, your microphone's off. Sorry. Howard, would you like to chime in with your thoughts on this? Hi. I think I share possibly at least some of the opinions of the, uh, you know, our, yeah, our fellow speakers had already presented. I think in the short run, um, 
this has to be, this will continue to be a very difficult issue between U.S. and China, uh, because there are each each of the parties are taking you know, different angles, looking at different things. And uh, uh, as I said, I'm I'm a pessimistic uh, about it, about uh, an immediate or a short-term solution, a short-term uh, abating, lessening of the, uh, the friction. But in the longer run, uh, I think uh, there will be opportunity for us to see some positive happening between the two countries. And then uh, certainly the positive implications of the relationship on the rest of the economies. Okay, thank you. So we, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. So we've got very interesting talking points here. I would like to talk about two things in particular. One is that not, not much has been done differently in China over the past two decades, for example. Why is it that things have come to a head now? Is it to do with the fact that, that you know, as as we mentioned, that Trump has been blunt and he's called it out? Is it to do with the fact that that many countries perceive China as being politically more belligerent than before? And the second question I would have is, what are the implications of what's happening between these two powers on, from an economic perspective, on other countries? particularly in, in Asia. So we know, for example, that before tech was in this whole equation, when it was more about trade and, and tariffs being slapped on each other's products, that countries such as Vietnam gained significantly. India was expected to make very small gains, but did. But Vietnam gained significantly. We saw a, a lot of reshoring happening. So, so yeah, so two questions. One, why have things come to a head now? And two, what, what in your view can be the implications on, on other, other Asian economies? Anybody? No. Okay. Feel no. free to go. Sure. I mean, I, I think it's just because China's become, it's, China's taken its place in the world, its rightful place in the world, right? We, as soon as, economic globalization started to occur in the 90s, you could see today happen. You could see it. You know, the, the energy and the talent uh, of, of a billion people was on court, right? And you can see it happening in the way that China sort of got rocketed, uh, you know, it, the economy rocketed to where it is. You could see it in the Beijing, you know, Olympics, how it was just brighter and better than anything in history, right? And how much pride there was in, in, in what was accomplished. And it just became, China became powerful. China's, you know, economy is now the second largest, you know, clearly on path to become the largest. The military is very powerful. It's, it's incredibly powerful now. Blue Water Navy getting built, you know, um, very powerful, you know, force projection capabilities. And then China centralized power. Um, president Xi did need to, but he openly declared that he's president for life. And that was for a reason, but, you know, that, that happened. Right, so that was all happening, and then it got called out publicly and exacerbated because America elected Donald Trump, and he's blunt. He was very blunt and uncouth and undiplomatic, and and so what what was reality, you know, was sort of exposed, you know, to the world, and it's it's a very natural occurrence. China is rightfully, right, you know, said rightfully be a powerful country, economically and militarily and in every way. And that's what happened. And, and so everything we're talking about in the context of trade, it's ancillary to the great power issues that are historical in nature, that people should really take a look at if you really want to see where, you know, where things are going. And I'm very, let me correct and clarify something I said earlier. I'm very bullish about uh, the, the prospects for Asian countries. Uh, especially if they manage to successfully avoid the great power rivalry or they embrace the great power rivalry, right? I'm not bullish about U.S.-China relations unless somebody can figure out a way for the two great powers to find common challenges and potentially common enemies. I, um, 
I think these issues between the US and China started before Trump. And, you know, for a long time, the US uh, approach was strategic engagement, hoping that China would become a responsible stakeholder in the international system and may become more politically open. And uh, when Xi Jinping took over the leadership of China, there was the hope that China would move more in this direction. And, of course, it took a few years for the Americans to realise that, in fact, Xi Jinping was taking China in the opposite direction. And it was the last few years of the Obama administration, the Obama's uh, approach to China changed quite a bit. And around that time, there were also many books that came out, academic studies, you know, the 100-year marathon, the Thucydides trap, and so on. So intellectual opinion also changed on, on uh, China. And so I think, you know, Trump took that to a higher level, and, of course, he was less polite and more aggressive. But that was already starting before the realisation that the strategic engagement approach, uh, the responsible stakeholder approach, just wasn't working. Okay. Thanks, John. Anybody else would like to offer their views on this? What, 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 what do we think are going to be the implications on, the, on other Asian economies? Great opportunity. Holy cow. I mean, amazing opportunity. Uh, ASEAN countries, Singapore. I mean, um, I think the neutral, they're, 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 they're the neutrals who really know how to play both sides. And then the non-aligned are coming into their own too, um, tr tremendously. I mean, Indonesia, Malaysia, Myanmar, um, they, they are going to be, be asked to pick a team. And during that period of time, they're going to have opportunities to get a lot of investment, a lot of aid from both sides. You know, and Singapore is serving as neutral territory for, for, uh, people who want to do deals, um, and we're we're seeing it in 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 the continued growth and and um, engagement by both sides with with the neutrals. It's just you know, in, incredible opportunity for for um, ex China Asian. I'd say that's true for uh, for like place like Singapore. Definitely a massive opportunity for Singapore. But um, I'm not so sure about the other uh, well Southeast Asian countries with, whether they might get sucked into that orbit and uh, what would be the power equations and how things are going to evolve. It's too early to say uh, how this is going to evolve, but uh, it could go well, as you said, Lee. If you're going to stay optimistic, it could actually work out really well because uh, like the rise of China, like, it's quite natural that there will be like a bit of friction as each of the superpowers gets like really used to dealing with each other, but uh, it's too early to say how this is going to evolve. Right? I mean, look at the investment in Vietnam right now. Right. And look at the free trade zones getting set up in Indonesia right now. People are, are you know, the, the buy side of the global economy. They're looking for alternatives right now, potentially to hedge against Chinese manufacturing dominance. And that's that's the reality. Yep. And so I have I have one following on from what's been discussed. I have an interesting question. And, you know, Henry Howard, if you'd like to take this on first and then I'd like to open it up to everybody. It, it doesn't center so much on trade per se. But with, with the growth of Chinese companies to the scale that they have reached now and with the troubles with ByteDance, TikTok, and then choosing to move the headquarters from Hong Kong to Singapore, as one example, with the Ant Capital's IPO, uh, IPO troubles, are we seeing or do you think we might see a point where, where Chinese companies have become so big or can become so large and influential that that there is a dichotomy between what the state wants, which has in effect promoted many of these companies, but with these companies really becoming far bigger than than what was perhaps ever conceived or you know thought of. Is there an interesting dichotomy there? Because you want your companies to succeed. The Chinese government clearly wants market leaders, world beaters across different areas. These companies have arguably reached that stage. But now is the same. Is, is there a fear, so to speak, about what these companies could accomplish or that they may even start looking elsewhere? Would you like to take that on, Howard? Henry? OK. Uh I think uh, in 
in, in the particular cases of big companies in China, uh, through the, I think, I think they, they are facing a different scenario of, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, a kind of, uh, supervision from the government, a, com- a different rules. Uh, and that means in the sense, it would be a little bit difficult or they have to change to adapt to the new rules of management from the government perspective. Uh, as to the sick, as to the issue whether they will move out of China, I, I don't think at this stage, I don't see that happening, uh, at this stage, no. Yeah. No, no, not so much move out of China, but just that, mm-hmm. that, that these companies may be too big to control. For example, if a company has gone and I, I get it, mm-hmm. they can't move out of China because their key markets are still going to be okay. key customers, market base yeah. is still China. Uh, Henry, do you see some sort of a dichotomy there or anybody else? Yeah, I think so. There is a, there is a possibility for the giant companies in China. They're trying to be more international, but they've given the, the system, Chinese system, but they have to, to work out a, a solution, how to accommodate to be international responsible business in the world stage. Yeah, they have to learn they have to get more in, in international intelligence and have to help the, the government to, to change their mind to, to work by the international rules and laws. But the political the, the system over there in China, they need to, to reach a balance with the, the system. And the government feels not friendly to them and not to, to uh, monopoly a certain industry, there will be, well, there'll be a, a possibility. But uh, what happened is the, the end group happening in China and the antitrust regulation coming out, uh, targeting the Jingdong group and Alibaba and the Mendes group. This uh, is just suffering. The, the, the public interest they have been affected right now. So there is a confrontation between government and, and the, the, the average Chinese people and also the rest of the market for the Chinese companies. So they need to work out a, a, a solution to to be responsible and in international, but it's a long way to go. Ahead. I think Henry nailed it. You know, anybody who thinks that any Chinese corporate, even giant, right, has a chance to establish any sort of independence, a real independence to, to gain greater access to global markets, just needs to talk to Jack Ma right now. You know, uh, he, he's the richest man in China, right? The best known entrepreneur, most successful business person. You know, he could be in jail tomorrow. You know, he could disappear, yeah, you know, tomorrow. But I think the opportunity is going to come when the next generation of tycoons, you know, who are sort of building their businesses and growing up in an era where power has been consolidated, when, when there's no question about who's the patron, the, what the patronage system you know, brought forth, come into their own, and then they will expand globally with Chinese rules, with state rules, under state rules. That has to, you know, yeah, state, the state will control international expansion, and China's powerful enough and the market's big enough internally so that China, I think, there's a very clear belief that China can set the rules. Yeah. No, I think for sure. But I think it was talking about the Jack Ma example. I think that's exactly the kind of thing I was talking about, wherein, wherein he's in many ways a product of the system. Yes, independent, but a product of the system. But one statement by Jack Ma is enough to result in... It, clearly, it's not something that's taken well by the authorities. And is that going to stop? You know, so so there is that dichotomy wherein somebody or a company believes that they can lay down some markers or suggestions which may not be taken well. Uh, one more one more theme that I wanted to focus on, touch upon very quickly. We have only two and a half minutes left. Is the around around tech is what we are seeing in India, for example. You know the ban on several several Chinese apps. 
So uh, is is that something that we fear we could start seeing more of, you know, tech decoupling with a lot of the larger markets and where we also see India, perhaps not with explicit government support, but clearly very significant implicit government support. We are seeing the creation of, you know, an Alibaba equivalent, just if we look at, if we look at uh, Geo, for example, right, which and so are we seeing a situation where countries really want to build national champions in the in the same mold, unfortunately, John, that that you were talking about, but in the same mold as how China has done things. Are we going to see more of that happen? And is that a cause of concern or celebration? I don't know. Any thoughts? Sashi, John? Depends on who you are. If you're the founders of those national champions, you're really happy. No, I mean, in the national interest. <laughs> you know, but it, it, it's not just, is it going to happen? It's happening, right? In in Russia, you have national champions in, in a whole bunch of these different, you know, these different categories. In India, they're coming up. And, and technology is used as, frankly, it's an instrument of control, right? Yeah. To buy, buy Actually, uh, yeah. I was... Um, uh, strongly opposed to it until I've become like strongly for it <laughs> because earlier I thought it's a bad idea for like, the government to create these can, champions. Can you? That's very interesting. Can you explain explain that in a little more content? Yeah, give us uh, go back like fifteen to twenty years ago, right? There was enough scope for like smaller companies to actually grow and become big. At this point, the giant platforms are so big that it's impossible to compete just by you starting up some capital and growing. I think. Uh, just like in China, I think you need state support to create some of the Indian champions. They're going to have a shot uh, at the prize. Otherwise, at this point, the platforms are just too massive to compete against. I think fundamentally you need a strong and effective state to do it. And, you know, China, the Chinese state is strong and can, can control the country. In Russia, Putin can control things. But I doubt in India that the, the state can control the country. It doesn't seem to be a country that's under control. Some would disagree, but uh, control right now. <laughs> no, but I think it's, it's it's a fascinating thing, right? That we are talking about the importance of state control and state support for enterprises. These these that those were themes that played out over the sixties, seventies, and eighties when when Asian economies grew and prospered, and you know, and that was something in the context of Singapore that Krugman, you know, very famously dis disregarded in terms of what happens with productivity. And it's just interesting that today productivity is probably the last thing on people's minds when, you know, there are such bigger issues at play and, and we're talking once again about the importance of, of state support. And uh, any last thoughts we, we are, we are done. Product, our, productivity is fundamentally the most important thing in any economy. And people forget that since the uh, global financial crisis, Productivity growth in China is going slower and slower and slower.